All right, line Y1, learning task five, we're gonna talk about wound rotor motor operation. And we're just gonna start by talking about what the whole purpose of a wound rotor motor is. Wound rotor motor, the whole purpose is to develop torque out of this. Now this drawing isn't inside of this learning task uh, that we're looking at right now. This drawing actually comes from your second learning task in here where we talked about different types of design classes that we could have for a squirrel cage induction motor. And all of these were off of a motor that had a regular three-phase motor. Remember, a wound rotor motor has a regular three-phase, uh, or sorry, stator. So all of them have the same types of stators, but it's going to be the characteristics of the way that the rotor itself is built that is going to go and give us design class A, B, C, or D. A and B were seen as being very similar. Design class A just had less restriction on the... Uh, amount of current that could go and flow inside of the rotor. But then uh, design class C was special. It had a really high starting torque that was higher than its breakdown torque. But the problem is it still breaks down relatively low, you know, 200% torque over here. Uh, and then we had our very last one over there, which was design class D. And design class D has a high starting torque and a high breakdown torque. And it was characterized by the fact that it had a high resistance type of rotor. What we're going to do with the wound rotor motor is we are going to go and take a design class D motor and we're actually going to go and do something really special with that design class D motor. We're going to have a high resistance rotor, which means we're going to have this overall curve here. But what we're going to be able to do with this curve is by selectively applying components, we are going to be able to go and adjust where this peak is going to go and be. Ultimately, what is happening inside of these design uh, or inside of these wound rotor motors, and I'm going to do this just by stretching this, is that we are going to take the same waveform and we are going to stretch that waveform out. And we are just going to move where we're going to go and get our maximum amount of torque. Well, that's a terrible looking uh, waveform that I have here. Let me just delete that one and redraw it. I'm just going to redraw it as being just a more exaggerated one, okay? Just so we can really see where the torques themselves are going to go and be. I'm going to draw it as being this hyper exaggerated curve where we're going to come up to a really high breakdown value of torque and then we're going to go and start out something like that. And it helps us to see the characteristics of this one because what that shows us is that this peak where it's happening right now is happening at a slip of about 40% by me being able to vary when the amount of resistance I'm able to move that peak all the way over to this point now you know we're by peak and now I'm happening at about 60% slip. And if I could drag this thing any further, I don't think that it's going to, oh, look at that, maybe it will allow me to drag it further. If I take it all the way over here, I can see that I'm going to go and get peak torque out that is going to go and happen at 100% slip. This is super valuable to us because 100% slip is startup. That's when there is full slip. In other words, I've just turned this motor on and it's starting to go and create that field. And the field is whipping around, but the rotor itself has not started to turn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my wound rotor motors with maximum amounts of resistance, which means that this curve is going to be stretched out the way that we see it right now. And then as that motor goes through its startup, I'm going to go and shoot this thing you know, further forward as I get to different values of slip. Once I get out to, you know, let's say maybe about this value of slip over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and readjust my wound rotor motor controls so that that peak now moves so that it's centered over top of there and a little bit forward so that now then I'm going to have maximum torque through you know this 30 to 40 and then once I get to this next step right about here where I'm starting to drop in my value of torque then I'm going to once again readjust that value my my rotor and move the torque over and so now I see that I'm having maximum torque over there and so then I'm going to go and move this thing a little bit further I'm going to continue speeding up my motor with this heavy load on it and then I'm going to go and you know move this thing maybe one last step so that I've got my maximum breakdown torque a little bit you know, further ahead there, sitting around you know this 20% this or something like that. What this does for us is this allows us to go and have a really, really, really constant and ridiculously high value of startup torque out of an AC motor. We've talked about torquey DC motors before, the series motor, but the problem with the DC motors was that we had to have brushes and a uh, commutator and we were limited, we had to have a DC supply. Now we can go and have a ridiculous torque out of a motor during startup and all the way along, provided we just monitor and switch out our uh, rotor circuit, we're going to be able to go and have that ridiculously high value of startup torque that we can then carry through all the way up until our operation.
So once again, just look at that curve we take. It's the same motor. We just stretch out and compact that curve. And all we're doing is we are just moving the peak of the torque along with the motor, starting out once again here, uh, as we go along through our slip over there. Yeah, look at that. I think that's pretty fantastic over there that we can you know, do this like that. How do we do it? Well, we're going to do it off of a bunch of math here. We're going to explain how this is happening so that we can understand the control circuits because we are going to have to take a look at our control circuits for these as well. Let's start by taking a look at the rotating magnetic fields. The synchronous speed of our rotating magnetic field is going to go and be defined off of this formula. N is going to be equal to F times 60 over top of P. Uh, where it's going to be us reworking that same frequency formula we had before. We're just, you know, changing around which values are where. Once again, the P is going to be the number of pole pairs. And because most of these ones are doing off of pole pairs, that's why I've stuck with the pole pairs one. You will sometimes see the same formula, but with a 120. If you see it with 120, they're talking about single poles, not pole pairs. It's up to you to identify that, you know, if it's going to be off of uh, one or the other. Our synchronous speed is going to go and happen instantaneously. Once we go and throw power to the stator, we're immediately going to go and get that uh, field that's going to start going and whipping around on the outside. Let's take a look at how that looks. So come on, let's move this one down here. Uh, how that looks when it comes to... the actual stator. So here's my stator. I'm just going to draw the stator itself out as just large motor stator over here. The instant that we go and turn on this, the power to this, we are going to go and have a field that is going to go and rotate at synchronous. So I'm going to have the field that is going to be rotating around the outside, around the outside at my synchronous speed. On the inside of that, I'm going to go and have the rotor. At the instant that I start this up, my rotor is going to be at zero RPM. I want you to just imagine, just pick any spot on that rotor, and we're going to go and place a little race car onto it. Okay, that looks like a box, but it's supposed to be a race car. Give them a little little fin at the end or something like that. Some tires, okay? I've got this little race car. So the instant that I start up this motor, what I'm going to go and have is I'm going to have the synchronous field that's going to be rotating at full synchronous speed. Let's give this thing a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM. Okay, I'm just selecting 1800 RPM as that's a standard value of synchronous speed. Uh, 1800 RPM we're using in this example, that's going to be its rotation. This one here is going to be at zero RPM. RPM. <clears throat> Which means that I'm going to go and have a field that is moving past every single conductor inside of this rotor. Okay, I'm just going to draw one conductor over here on the side right now. I'm going to go and have a field that is moving at 1800 revolutions per minute past there, which means that we are going to go and have everything that we need to go and build values of voltage. EG is equal to BLV. We are going to have flux density that's going to be from our outside field. We're going to go and have length of conductor that's going to be these actual rotor windings and we are going to go and have difference between because my synchronous field is moving faster than my rotor. So I'm going to generate a fair bit of voltage and a fair bit of current that's going to be inside of there. However, I'm also going to go and have a ridiculously crappy value at the moment of startup of my XL, my inductive reactance. You should know what XL is. It is defined by 2 pi FL. And this is going to be, L is going to be my inductance in Henry, so it's going to be based upon the coils. Do we have coils in here? Absolutely. Will they have an inductive uh, value of L? Absolutely they will. It's going to be fixed. It's going to be based upon the way that they are built. There's another formula for L. You should know that one as well, but we're not going to go through it here right now. The big thing that we're going to go and see is that the frequency that the synchronous field is lapping the rotor, because the rotor is still at a standstill right now, the uh, frequency that we are lapping the rotor is going to be really, really high, which means that my frequency inside of this formula is going to be high as well. And therefore, as a result, my XL value, my inductive reactance, is going to be super, super high as well. Now, going back to basic three-phase motor theory, we are going to go and have maximum torque that is going to be produced at any point where I am going to go and have uh, XL that is going to be equal to my R. In other words, I'm going to go and have XL and R. Well, what is this R going to go and be? 
this R is going to go and be my resistance of my rotor itself. On a standard squirrel cage motor, the resistance of the rotor itself is really, really small. Okay, so we'll just draw out a standard squirrel cage motor over here. Standard one, we've got a tiny little bit of resistance. We've got a lot of XL that is going to go and happen like that. And um, this just, just happens at the moment of start that we're going to have this massive amount of XL off of these. Both of these are supposed to be L's, by the way. I don't know, it kind of looks like C. Um, <clears throat> this is going to go and lead us into another formula, and this is another one that we've covered already, and you should also know. It's going to be my torque formula. Torque is going to be equal to K, that's the constant, the way that the motor is built. Phi, that's going to be my flux that I'm going to have. I of my rotor, the current of my rotor that I'm going to go and have, uh, multiplied by the cosine of my rotor. <coughs> So the power factor of my rotor that I'm going to go and have over here. <coughs> Excuse me. If you take a look at these two triangles that I have over here, uh, and if you take a look at the actual Z, the impedance that I'm going to go and have across here, you should see that the Z is going to be slightly smaller on here, but that Z that we have that is slightly smaller is still pretty close to the Z that I have over here. In fact, we could go and put this thing together as a triangle and uh, calculate out values. Why don't we just throw some values of resistance and inductance off of these so we can get some corresponding values of Z. I won't go through all of the trig values off of this one. Uh, you can all do trig at this point. I have that expectation of you. But uh, I'm just going to put in the values that we would have for a triangle that's going to have a small amount of resistance and high XL, and then another one where I'm going to have an XL that is going to be equal to my value of R. And we are going to go and analyze those. So let me just put these values onto here, and then we will do this analysis. And there's a couple things that are going to be real critical. First of all, we said that uh, we need to know what our power factor is going to go and be as well. So I'm going to make this one here a value of 4 for my XL and a value of 1 for my resistance, which is going to go and get me to this value over here that is going to be 4.123. And that's going to be my Z value. And then I'm going to do the same for this one over here, where I'm going to go and now do 4 for my R value and 4 for my XL value because I say that we are going to have you know the maximum amount of torque that we are going to get out for a given machine anytime that I'm at this 45 degrees or where these things are going to be equal. My impedance for this one is going to be 5.65 for this one. The angles are really critical for us over here as well. This is going to be 45 degrees. This one over here is going to go and be 75.9 that we are going to go and have. Okay, what we can do now that we have got values of resistance and uh, reactants and therefore impedance, we could say that our rotor, and once again, I'm gonna just grab this number as an example number. We're not calculating it off of somewhere. I'm just gonna say that based upon the speed and the windings, etc., that we are going to go and generate a value of voltage in our rotor of, uh, let's, let's just go to 30 volts, okay? So I'm gonna have 30 volts on my rotor itself. If I take that 30 volts on the rotor, I'm just going to open up the calculator over here, and if I use that impedance, I should be able to figure out values of current that I would have operating in each one of these. So I'm going to start by taking 30 volts on a rotor, and I'm going to see what that would look like over top of this impedance. 4.123 that we're going to divide it by, so 30 divided by 4.123 which gets me out to a current of 7.27 amps. Okay, I'm just gonna go and write that one down over here. 7.27 amps on my rotor for that one. For this other triangle over here, it's gonna be 5.652, so 30 volts, divided by 5.652, which gets me out to a value of 5.3 amps. 5.3 amps on my rotor. What we then do is we take these values, my current on my rotor, and I'm going to be able to go and put that into a formula for a torque that I could go and have for any given value. I'm going to just disregard these and we're going to say for the same machine, you know, we're just going to say that each of these has got a value of one and one. So if I take this first formula up over here and I do that calculation, I'm just going to remove this motor, we don't need the motor and everything there anymore. If I go and remove that one right now, we'll have a formula that's going to go and say one, let's put that in for a K times one times my current 7.27 times my co
cosine of my rotor angle. Well, my rotor angle is 75.9, so if I go and do cosine of 75.9, I come out to a value of 0.24, okay? So I'm just going to take this multiplied by 0.24. If I compare that to this one, which has got a lower amount of rotor currents, I would have the same type of formula, 1 for my k times 1 for my phi, times my current value now, which is going to be 5.3, multiplied by the cosine of my angle. My angle at this point is going to be 45, so I'll just do cosine of 45, which gets me out to a value of 0 0.71. 0 0.71. Okay, I'm just going to punch these into the calculator now individually. We'll see which one of these wins the torque of battle. Okay, 7.27 multiplied by 0.27 times 1, I'm just going to put that in, you know, mentally, times 1, which is still 7.7 times 0 0.24, which gets me out to a overall value of torque for that example that we just did there of 1.74. So this one here equals 1.74. If I want to take a look at this bottom one over here, I've got a lower amount of rotor current, but I've got a much higher rotor power factor. So 1 times 5.3 is 5.3 times 1 is another, you know, it's still going to be 5.3. So 5.3 times 0 0.71. 5.3 times 0.71, which gets me out to a value of 3.76. 3.76. Holy crap, would you take a look at that? What we see over here is that we have got a complete winner when it comes to torque. Even though they've got relatively similar values of impedance across the rotors over here, it is the fact that we have got this rotor impedance that corresponds with a really good angle compared to a real crap angle over there that allows us to go and develop, in this case, at least double, pushing close to triple, the amount of torque out by just having, you know, this really, really good triangle. So what's going to go and define this really good triangle? This really good triangle is just going to be defined off of any time that I have got a resistance value that is going to be approximately equal to my reactance value, my XL. And going back into our basic motor theory, our XL of our rotor, our reactance, is going to go and drop as my motor comes up to speed. I'm just clear a whole pile of this so we can just finish up that formula or that uh, theory so we can then kind of get around to doing some of these, these calcs over here. Eli, why are you going nuts? Um, XL is equal to 2 pi FL. So the XL of my rotor is going to be based upon the frequency that that synchronous field is passing my rotor, which means that my XL during startup is going to go and be really high. So I'm just going to do a, a value of XL based upon my slip. Okay, we're going to go and call this one here slip. This is going to be 100% slip. This is going to be 0% slip. And what I'm going to go and have is I'm going to go and have a curve that's going to go and look like this, where I'm going to go and have at 100% slip, I'm going to have a really high value of XL, but as I get further and further along, this value of frequency, the difference between my synchronous speed and my rotor is going to be going down. It's going to be getting lapped less, therefore it's going to go and have less and less XL. So I see that as I go through my slip, I'm going to go and have less and less, or as I go through my operation, I'm going to have less and less XL. What I'm going to want to do in order to go and keep this triangle at the same sort of, you know, XL equal to my R is that the instant that I start up, I'm going to want to have a large amount of R that I'm then going to go and drop out in the same manner as my XL. And as long as I've got an R value that follows my XL value over there, I'm going to be able to go and have a triangle that's going to have the magical 45 degrees. That is going to go and give us maximum torque based off of that formula. Torque is equal to K font I rotor and then my cos, uh, cos theta of my rotor as well. Okay. Now let's go into the rest of their drawings that they have over here. So we described how we're going to go and get that maximum torque that we are going to go and have. Now let's go and take a look at what they have here. 
What they're going to show us for the very first one is they're using variable resistances inside of the rotor circuit. Basically, where I'm going to go and have three rheostats that are going to go and have a common handle that is going to be used to uh, operate all three of these at the same time. So I'm going to be able to go and start them with maximum resistance, R at max, uh, max at startup. And then as my motor comes up to speed, I'm going to go and drop that value of resistance through here. If I had my terminal short circuited, we're going to go and have this curve. Now we talked about this right at the very beginning that this curve is going to go and be, it does exist, it's a little bit longer than that, but it's going to go and have this torque, this peak over here all the way at the top. What we're gonna do is we are just going to go and take this same torque curve, because this is a torque curve for a motor based upon the construction of that motor. And all we're going to do is we are going to go and stretch it over and move that torque peak all the way over so that the torque peak is going to be here. And the way that we stretch it over is we just connect this thing up to a bunch of resistance. I'm just going to grab my components here once I find my mouse. There we are. And then we will drag all of this over and we will stretch that thing out once again. Just delete a few here and then we will make this thing happen. Okay, so we're going to go take a look at this peak. So this will be with it short circuited. Short circuit is bad because I see at 100% torque I'm getting crappy amount of torque, right? At 100% slip, I'm getting a crap amount of torque out of there. What I want to do is I want to go and have the peak of my torque, I want to have that peak of my torque correspond with where my motor is in operation for any given time. And we're just going to do that by stretching it. Once again, I'm just going to select this and group it here. And beautiful. Now I've got a group that I can drag over. So what we're going to see is at the moment of startup, we are going to go and have maximum torque that we are going to go and uh, put in and then I'm going to have the, the maximum resistance inside there because I got maximum resistance I get maximum torque and then as my motor comes up to speed so my slip is getting less and less I'm just going to continue to go and adjust and keep myself under the peak torque as I'm going along over here. That's all that we're showing inside of these next couple of graphs over here you know they're showing this uh, figure three and then they give us figure uh, three, where they're showing that, you know, we've moved the peak all the way over here and then figure four where they're moving it back. It's the exact same thing as what we are doing whenever we are just moving that graph all the way along. Once again, I'm just going to go back to mine because it's easier than looking at it on a bunch of pictures. Their pictures, their figures that they have inside of here, figures two, three, and four can all be defined by this moving curve that we see over here. We move the torque over. So we've got maximum torque at 100% slip, and then as we get faster and faster, we continue to move the peak of that waveform over. Once we get all the way to the very far end of it, what we're going to do is we're going to remove the resistance. We're going to completely short out our value of resistance once we get to full operational speed. So over here where they're showing us with this variable resistance, what we would want to have happen is once we get this thing all the way up to speed, that we can just short across from line to line to line over here so that we aren't running anything through these resistances. These resistances are good, they're necessary for startup, but they're not designed to be dissipating heat the entire time that we're operating our motor. They could be actually, I shouldn't say they aren't necessarily, but in most cases, they're not gonna be designed for 100% operation. We wanna go and pull these things out. Not to mention um, the efficiency of the motor, the amount of power in compared to the power out that we are going to go and have off of it, right? So the power out over top of the power in that we are going to go and have is going to be completely different. And if we have to have a bunch of input power that we are wasting on the resistors over here, the overall efficiency of that motor is going to go down. We have crap efficiency during the whole startup cycle because during the whole startup cycle, we are going to be using those resistors for us to go and move our torque curve along. But once we get all the way through, then what we'll do is we're just going to go and remove it and we're going to have efficiency that's going to be very, very similar to what we would have inside of a standard squirrel cage induction motor. Okay, let's go and talk about these things as well for speed control. We do not use them commonly for speed control so much inside of industry. They do exist for speed control, 
but they are not necessarily used for that. A lot of times now, if we need speed control, we are going to go and use AC variable frequency drives to go and give us that speed control. So this is more an artifact, but it's still used in some places because in a lot of cases, we didn't have these wound rotor motors until we had a high, high amount of torque we had to go and move. You know, we're talking about motors that are going to be in the hundreds of horsepower used in massive industry. And so in some cases, you're going to have 40 year old motors that are wound rotor motors because they didn't have drives available at that point, and they're still using them for speed control. Speed control can be best defined off of this graph over here. In this graph, we're not looking to go and develop maximum amounts of torque. You know, that's what these motors were designed for was to get maximum amounts of torque. We're just looking to go and uh, get 100% torque. And so all we're doing is we're just following along this 100% torque line over here. Uh, it's once again, when we're using these as speed control, we're not necessarily using them for their maximum amount of torque that we're going to go and have out. What we would see is this is that same waveform. We've just taken this A waveform. We've stretched it way out. So its peak is going to be like somewhere way off over here right now. And when we've got it stretched out with the maximum resistance inside of there, we cross at 100% torque at about 50% slip. So what we would do uh, for this one, if we wanted to go and have 50% slip, that's going to go and give me, you know, 50% speed. If my synchronous speed is 1800 RPM, 50% slip would be 900 RPM that I could go and run this thing at. So I'm going to go and have 900 RPM that this thing would be running at. You know, it could go a little bit up, a little bit down from there based upon the load as well. But what I would be doing is that I'm going to just be switching in as I move from component to component over here, where I'm going to go and have maximum resistance when I want to be low speed, then I'm going to go and take some resistance out, which is going to go and bring me to a higher speed at that same amount of torque. So it's just going to jump me up now to over here where I'm going to be about like 25% slip, etc. And then you'll be able to jump out and jump out, etc. As we move along here, getting ourselves closer and closer to my synchronous speed that I'm going to have for that machine. I do want to note that this is going to be a pretty coarse value of speed control that we are going to go and have out of it if we are going to be switching out banks of resistors. If, however, I do have a continuous resistance that I can switch out, something like this where I've got actual rheostats, then I'm going to be able to go and get relatively smooth operation because I'm going to be able to be moving this 100% one all the way across instead of switching out in stages. Some cases as well, there is also a little point inside your binder where they talk about uh, we need to go and have some resistance in uh, our secondary circuit inside of the rotor circuit. We can have resistance that is going to be caused by resistors burning up the uh, current as heat or we can go and have resistance that is going to be caused by us putting it back into the system and using it to feed something else. Remember Watt's law, or sorry, not Watt's law, uh, Newton's law, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only go and change form. So in most cases, we take electrical energy and we convert it into heat, and then that's going to be our load. But instead of us converting energy into heat as a loss, what we can do is we can convert it back into other stored energy, you know, potential energy, or into, you know, energy that's uh, going into another machine. So regenerative control can be used as well. What we do is we just convert and then we go and sync it up with our main lines and feed that back out. As far as our duty cycle is for our secondary resistors, um, they are going to be ranked based upon the amount of time that we are going to be using or the amount of startups that I'm going to go and have. So if it's only going to be used for starting, I'm going to be able to get these things super hot because they're going to have a lot of time to go and cool off in between. If I'm going to be continuously using them for speed control, like in these situations over here, I'm going to have to be much more careful with them and I'm going to have to make sure that that continuous speed control that it can handle that of my resistors themselves. So just make sure they're rated either for continuous uh, duty or that they're only used for starting duty. And if they are only rated for starting duty, make sure that you are only using them as starting duty. Reversing rotation on these is going to be done the exact same way as on any other standard uh, three-phase motor. If I want to go and reverse my rotation, all I need to do is interchange any two lines. It could be A and B, it could be B and C, or it could be lines A and C that are going to go and be interchanged. 
Uh, in a lot of cases, it is going to be A and C that is going to be interchanged because if you remember, my standard phase rotations are A, B, C, and my opposite rotation is going to be C, B, A. You'll note that B stays the same, that it is an interchanging of A and C that is going to go and happen. Yes, interchanging B and C does, you know, do the same thing, or A and B does do the same thing. You just, you know, uh, further along in the cycle, but the standard is to go and interchange A's and C's off of these. Your company standard might be different. Your journeyman that you're working with uh, is going to have an you know, open brought up under one system or the other, and they're going to have on all of their sites that they say, you know, we interchange A and B or A and C, or some just don't really care at all. They say, eh, hey, interchange any two, you know, as long as the motor runs in the correct direction, I don't really care. So for us, for the wound rotors, uh, yeah, interchange any two lines, but they're going to be lines on the stator that we're going to go and interchange. All right, let's talk about our advantages, last of all, uh, of our wound rotor motor. Um, these are going to be listed to give us five bullet points over here. The biggest one is high starting torque with a low amount of current. We can get high starting torque out of other types of motors, but we're going to have to deal with massive inrushes, which can disrupt the rest of our electrical system. And in some cases, you know, blow main fuses and stuff. We don't want that, so we're going to go to this high amount of resistance in our rotor that is going to go and match the high XL and give us a low rotor current, but a ridiculously high rotor value of uh, power factor. Remember that same formula, torque is equal to K phi I on my rotor and my cos on my rotor as well. So we're going to go with a really high value of this. We're going to go with a really low value of this because we're going to go and have a matched impedance that we are going to have off of it. It does give us this ridiculously high torque with low current. That's our number one advantage. Uh, smooth acceleration under heavy load. We're able to go and either use adjustable resistors or switch stuff out the way that we have inside of here. Uh, no abnormal heating. We're not going to overheat the stator because the stator is not putting through ridiculous amounts of current. It's just putting through efficient current. And it's going to have good running resist uh, characteristics once the starting resistance is removed. Remember, it's uh, very similar to a regular squirrel cage motor once we have gotten this thing up to speed. And we can use it as adjustable speed. Not really so much of a huge advantage, but in some cases it is. Okay, so the high starting torque with the low current, um, basically they're just giving us this exact same thing as the formula over here. The power factor is improved and the current is going to be more in phase with our stator flux which is overall giving us a small amount of current, but an efficient amount of current. You just, you know, instead of trying to go and necessarily understand their whole paragraph there, go off of this that we get that really good torque because we can deal with this low value of rotor current while we're dealing with a really high value of rotor power factor, or 45, which is going to be our best value of power factor. As soon as we go too far in the opposite way, too much resistance, too little inductance, then we start to go and have losses in the other direction as well. Smooth acceleration under heavy loads can be accomplished through switching out uh, resistances. If I've got a very large amount of load that I'm going to go, uh, torque that I need to go and deliver off the motor, this is the shaft, here's my slip rings and my brushes, I have this thing connected, it's going to start delivering, and as I start this thing on the delivery, what I'm going to have is usually heavy duty, high wattage resistance banks. Rheostats are just not rated for the same amount because they've got that moving contact along there. They tend to go and burn out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use resistances like this. I'm going to start with all of these contactors wide open. Current takes a path of least resistance. Right now, the only path for current, if I take a look at this, my resistances are connected in Y. I see it leading in on a line. There's no connection, no connection, no connection. So I go through resistance, 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 and then I connect onto a star point over here. So each of my windings is basically a winding like that. Okay, I'm not going to bother drawing the rest. You get the idea. What we have is we can start this thing up with maximum resistance. As it starts coming up to speed, I'm going to go and switch out. I'm going to close contact A. And at that point, current takes the path of least resistance. So my current through my Y is now going to go through these and then back up and you know, split onto my other lines. So then we are going to have less resistance inside there. My motor continues to go and accelerate. I'm then going to go and switch out into this one. So now I'm going to have an even shorter path for current. It's just going to have to go through these over here. And then once I get this thing all the way up to full speed, I am going to go and, or not full speed, but you know that I've got my load started, etc. close enough to full speed, it never hits synchronous. Then I'm going to go and close this set of contacts over here. It's going to be my last set. If I close this contact first, it would have short-circuited 
all the resistance out of it. So I'm going to start at the far end and to just close an A, then B, then C. A doesn't have to stay closed after B has closed in because it's going to have short circuited. It's going to, you know, let all that resistance out. Same as B doesn't have to go and stay closed after C has. In a lot of cases we do because it's just easier controlled, but we could switch either one out. What we'll get is we're going to get this step type of acceleration looking very similar to this, where at the instant of startup, I'm going to have 100% slip. So I'm going to go and have a torque value that's going to be up here in you know, my 150-ish range right now uh, off of this motor that they're specifically showing us. And I'm going to go and allow my motor to accelerate. And to, down here, I get to 100% torque. At that point, I'm going to say, oh, my torque is dropping. It's at the 100% level. So I'll just kick up to my next level, I'm going to go and switch in A, that A contact off of that uh, one, which now moves me onto this curve, and then I'm going to follow this curve as it drops, and then B, I'm going to switch in, and now I'm going to go and drop in B, and then C is going to go and switch in, and now I'm going to be down to my 100% like that. We follow that line in starting at 100% slip and moving across to my full rated running, uh, running speed over here. This is going to be from, uh, you know, I'm going to have an overall slip that's going to be sitting here around, you know, maybe three to five percent off of these ones. So there has to be slip. If there is no slip, there would be no voltage generated inside of the rotor and no frequency generated inside of the rotor. And I would not have any induced voltage and therefore I would not have any motor action. So there will always be some slip in there. It's a relatively jagged line. Do 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 that I'm seeing as I'm going along here. If I wanted to smooth it out, I could just have more resistances. I could split this resistance in half and add in another set of contacts, etc. It just complicates your amount of control that you are going to go and need to have. Talking about the other benefits that they listed over here, the abnormal heating uh, on a regular squirrel cage induction motor, I'm going to have a ridiculously high value of current for my inrush. Because it's so high, I'm going to go and dissipate a lot of heat. Remember that my Watts law states that I squared R is going to be my watts. So if I have a super, super huge value of inrush current, I'm going to have a super high value of watts that's going to be dissipated as well. Good running characteristics. Um, good running characteristics are just going to be the same as any standard squirrel cage induction motor. Once I get up to speed, we're going to have a standard slip, you know, three to five percent uh, on these things. They say it's not as good as a standard squirrel cage motor. It depends on the manufacturer and the quality of the motor, but it is still going to be a relatively good running characteristics once we get this thing all the way up and we don't have any extra heat taken off of those resistors at that point as well. It does also have that adjustable speed but we don't really have you know that uh, we're going to use them for that. It does have some disadvantages as well. Uh, disadvantages are going to be physical size because I now need to go and incorporate all of the slip rings and the brushes and things like that onto my uh, circuit. I'm also going to have a higher initial maintenance cost. More components means more cost. I'm going to go and have more cost as well in the control, you know, the control components. Plus, I have to have somebody that understands how these things operate so they can go and maintain it. That's going to be you guys, you know, that we're relying on the industry to be able to do that. And I'm going to have poor speed regulation if I leave the resistance inside of my circuit. So they go through, you know, once again, um, a little bit of detail off of those ones. The last point on the poor speed regulation just would mean that the efficiency is going to be reduced when I leave the resistance in off of uh, this. If I would leave these resistors in, I'm going to be always dissipating some heat off of here. Plus, I'm going to have shrunk. If I get this, allow this to stay in, I'm going to go and have a small XL because I'm going to be almost up to speed and my synchronous field is not lapping the rotor field as much. Uh, but I'm going to have a high amount of R, and what that means is I'm going to go and have this front angle, a really low angle, which if I go into a cosine of a really low angle, it's going to go down. What you'll find if you use the cosine operator, by the way, is that your cosine operator gives you a curve, a mathematical curve that looks like that. The peak of the curve is going to be at 45 degrees, and then as I move further away, on either direction, you know, zero down to zero degrees or all the way up to 90 degrees, it's going to go and drop the amount that we have. And because we use that as our multiplier for torque uh, off of these things, um, it's going to go and have poor torque. Once I get to this point, if it's got poor torque, that means it's going to have poor speed regulation because poor torque means it's more easily affected by loads on it. Where do we use these things? Uh, we use these things for heavy, high-torquey startups. To give you a couple of examples, in overhead cranes or gantries, 
Uh, heavy mechanical work involves, you know, lifting large engines, large truck bodies off, etc. So overhead gantries and cranes. We also want to have a motor that when we have got something suspended, we can go and start that thing up and it's not going to, you know, get spooled in the opposite direction. Ball mills, which we don't see a load of down here in the Fraser Valley, but in mining, you go up to Copper Mountain in, uh, just outside of Princeton, BC, is about two hours away. It's this huge open pit mine. They've got these massive ball mills. I've been inside there for a tour. It was actually pretty fantastic. Um, and it's a huge drum that they crush ore. So they put in just rough rock, and then they put in these balls that are about the size of your head, about watermelon-sized balls that they can start out with. And it looks like a dryer drum. It's got fins on the inside, and those fins pick up the ore and the balls, and then it lifts them and eventually they kind of tumble out on the top of each of those fins and so the uh, the ore falls and so do the balls onto the actual ore. It crushes them and breaks them down. The balls, by the way, undergo all these like really weird stresses. If you ever are around a ball mill, do not take any of the balls with you. You know, the worn out balls, they throw them out because they get too small. They're no longer effective. Uh, but those worn out balls have all sorts of weird stresses inside them from the way that they've been hammered and pounded and they actually just spontaneously rupture because of the way that the stresses have been pounded into them, you know, and they just, they sit under stress, even when they're sitting static, they're under a phenomenal amount of stress. They store these things inside of an actual cage, like a heavy duty cage. And if you walk by that cage, every once in a while you hear bang as one of these balls go off. And sometimes it's like bang, 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 because it sets off a couple others as well. Kind of funky. Anyways, um, not as much used over here, but ridiculously high values of torque. You've got to think about a dryer drum that's about 20 feet high filled with ore and with steel balls that you're going to get rolling. So they got to give these things massive amounts of torque. Loaded conveyors as well. Uh, when we're dealing with heavily loaded conveyors or sometimes with heavily loaded extrusions, uh, plastics, you're going to find the uh, high torques more out here in the lower mainland in manufacturing where we've got plastic manufacturing. We melt the plastic, but it's still relatively thick and we have to go and, you know, press it with pumps, etc., into these uh, molds. So we'll use the torques inside of those type of areas. All right, that is it for our operation of a wound rotor motor. What we'll have to do next is we're going to have to go and take a look at how we control them. Now that we know about the operation, let's talk about this whole circuit and how we control it.